Thank you. So the reason I bring a FreeBSD talk to a Linux conference is not that I think that FreeBSD is much nicer and you should all be using FreeBSD. I mean, obviously I think this, but that's not the only reason. I think there are lessons to be learned from this. I think a lot of what I've done with uh, PF in FreeBSD is something that could actually be done relatively easily in Linux as well. And the central thesis of the talk, I'll give away the ending right now, is testing is good, you should do more testing. Right, now that that's done, we can all go get a beer, right? Uh, anyway, uh, the obligatory blatant self-promotion. Uh, you've already heard my name. You've got an email address. I work on PF in FreeBSD. In FreeBSD, uh, we'll get into that later. Professionally, I do embedded Linux projects as well as FreeBSD things. I want to make it very clear that I'm not for sale, but I am for rent. Talk to me about rates. Uh, talking about PF, because perhaps you pe find people don't know PF. PF is a packet filter. It's a firewall. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's quite a nice firewall. We've got some more in FreeBSD, so you're spoiled for choice. Uh, this particular one we took from OpenBSD. Uh, they've only got the one, uh, and we stole it from them. Well, you know, they can still use it, but we've got it too. Uh, we stole it a while ago, so what we've got is an older version. There are some, sub well, subtle and not so subtle differences between them, but trust me, ours is pretty nice too. Uh, we've got one or two things that they don't have, one of which is VNet, which we'll go into later. Another one is that it's multi-core capable and a good bit faster than the OpenBSD ver version. They've got newer syntax, they've got a bunch of features we don't have, so I don't want to say that, you know, oh, there's something wrong with OpenBSD, but you should still be using FreeBSD rather than OpenBSD. Sorry? NetBSD is very nice as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, uh, c come to the BSD community. We've got religious wars as well. <laughs> so, automated testing. Why automated testing? Well, it turns out that when you've got users, and um, uh, they like it when things actually work. Yeah, I know, it surprised me too. On top of that, it's also really nice to have, you know, test cases when you want to try something out. It also means that when something works today, it's not suddenly going to stop working tomorrow, which is another nice thing to have. It's also nice that when you're doing development on things, I've, I've recently done some performance work on something, and when you make you know, a large change for performance changes, it's nice that you can figure out, does this actually still work? Uh, talking about regressions, I've got two examples, and there really are two different examples, despite both of them being about IPv6 fragment handling, and if you want me I'm not going to go into too much detail about what the bugs were, but I have several excellent rants about IPv6 and fragments, so buy me beer and I'll tell you. Uh, but these are good examples because the first one happened back in December of 2016. Somebody introduced a IPv6 fast path for forwarding in FreeBSD, and you know, faster forwarding is excellent, but they accidentally broke PF's ability to handle v6 fragments and then nobody noticed for nine months. Slightly embarrassing. You know, we noticed it got fixed, that's fine. But nine months is a really long time for something to be broken. And you know, it's only IPv6 fragments, but it's still quite nice if that actually works. Somewhat more recently, in fact, in August of last year, uh, somebody else broke it again. Uh, this actually happened fixing a security bug. Uh, some of you may remember the uh, fragment handling issue where you could exhaust resources, consume a lot of CPU time by crafting specific chains of fragments. Quite an amusing bug in that it affected everyone. Uh, there were fixes in Linux, there were fixes in FreeBSD, there were fixes in uh, other BSDs. I'm not sure if, if OS X and Windows were affected, but a lot of people were affected by by that issue, and somebody very kindly fixed that in the IP stack and accidentally broke the reassembly code and didn't notice. 
fortunately, by this point, we've had tests for PF, which started failing. And then obviously everyone blamed me because it's PF, it's my fault. So when I started investigating, I discovered that, well, actually PF is not broken, it's the rest of the IP stack that's broken. The difference here being is that it was broken on August 14th and got fixed on August 31st, which is broken for two weeks, which is still longer than you want things to be broken, but it's a lot better than nine months. Also a very amusing bug, this one. Uh, when you started tracing it, it went away. <laughs> no, really. Uh, buy me a beverage of your choice and I will tell you all about it. So tests, what do we want from tests? Well, we want them to be easy to run, easy to write, because up to this point I've been writing them and this is a theme we'll touch on quite often. I'm really lazy, so I want other people to do the work for me. Uh, so that's why we want them to be easy to write because I understand that I'm not perhaps the only lazy person in the universe. So other people want things to be easy as well. We also want them to be fast to run, so that whenever you make a small change, you'll just go, oh, well, let's just run these tests and make sure it hasn't broken. We'd also like them to integrate with the existing test framework that we've got. Um, we've got ci.freebsd.org, uh, which is our Jenkins instance, and one of the things it does is it runs our tests. And we've got tests for, well, you can see, for all sorts of things, bin cat, just in case somebody would break cat. <laughs> well, you know, uh, important lesson in testing is that even a very simple test will occasionally catch bugs. So write the simple test. It'll cover something. It won't be a lot of work, but it'll cover something and it will catch some bugs. And your life will be slightly better. Uh, in this, well, back when I took this screenshot, we had 7,300 tests and most of them passed. It's a, a different discussion, but it's when you've got tests, it's important to run them and it's important to make sure that they keep passing because if you have a pile of failing tests, people are not going to notice that, hey, there's one more that fails and one more and, and it sort of becomes pointless. Moving slightly closer to, you know, how do we test this firewall thing? Uh, because, you know, how would you usually test a firewall? You take a bunch of hardware, you take a machine to send packets, a machine to be the firewall, a machine to receive packets, and coordinating multiple machines and running the latest software on it is a huge pain in the everything. Enter VNet. VNet's a pretty shiny new feature in FreeBSD 12, uh, which extends our existing jail system. So think of jails as containers, except we got there before the cool kids got there. Uh, which means that you can have an IP stack associated with your jail. You can put network interfaces in your jail and that jail owns the network interface. It can set IP addresses, it can send packets, it can even run a firewall. Uh, from uh, FreeBSD 12.0, that's supported with PF. And by supported, I mean, as far as I know, it works. And if it breaks, I will actually try to help you. Um, so we can create a jail and we can give it its own IP stack and we can run a firewall in it. And creating jails is really fast and really easy. Trust me on this, it's really easy because that's how you start a jail with its own IP stack. I'm, you know, I'm sure you can figure out what that does. We start a jail, we name it Alcatraz because I think that's funny. <laughs> um, we say that we want it to be a VNet as opposed to our uh, other style of jails and we want it to persist. We want it to keep living even when there are no processes in it. Of course, I've cheated slightly in that this jail has its own IP stack and when you would log into that jail, you would see that it has dev LO0, the loopback device, but it doesn't have any network interfaces. So obviously, you know, adding network interfaces is going to be really hard, right? Well, not that hard, to be honest. We can create an ePair E-pairs, uh, think of them as two network cards with a wire but, uh, in between them. They're virtual networking devices, they're virtual ethernet cards, and when you create, when you say, you know, I create an e-pair, you will get two of them, because the two of them are connected together. You'll get 
e pair 0 A and B or e pair 1 A and B, depending on how many you create. So, for example, we'll assign an IP address to uh, the first end of it, to uh, e pair 0 A. We'll create a jail. So, again, create the jail Alcatraz VNAT persist, and we'll tell it, hey, VNAT interface e pair 0 B. And now my jail has a network interface. What is also really nice about jails is that it's really, really easy to reach into them and do things. So, you know, e execute in jail Alcatraz the command ifconfig e pair 0 b, set an IP address, set it up, and now I can ping the jail. All done, I have a virtual, functionally I have a virtual machine with an IP stack. What I could do now, and we'll go into an example uh, soon, is I can, Set, an, uh, set up a firewall, I can set rules, and I can see what happens when I do this. So going through a, a slightly detailed test, this is a very basic pass block test for v4 packets, as it says in the description. So what this does, this is, a, this is a, the start of a test script. There's more, there's more interesting things, but basically, you know, we include a utilities function or a utilities file, a file with a bunch of utility functions rather. Uh, we declare a test case. We say that it's got a cleanup function which we'll get to in a few slides. In the head we describe the test, so description, basic pass block test, and this test requires that we run this as root because I don't think it surprises anyone that we require you to be root to create new network interfaces or create new jails. And then we can run the test, and this is a, well, it's a simplified version, but this is a useful test. We initialize, basically what the initialization code does is make sure that, you know, we're going to test PF, so let's make sure that we've remembered to load the PF kernel module. Let's also check that we support VNet, because while it is on by default in 12, it didn't used to be, so let's check for that. We create an ePair. PFTMK e pair, we assign an IP address to the e pair. We've seen this before, right? There's a utility function to create the jail. Uh, basically, all that does is remember that, hey, you've created this jail so that when we do the cleanup, it will just automatically remove this jail. Uh, we assign the B end of that uh, interface to the jail. We give it an IP address. And now we can ping that jail. So we'll uh, tell it that, hey, our first test is a very basic sanity test. We've not activated the firewall, but let's make sure that we can ping that, uh, that jail. So, check that the exit status will be zero, ignore the output, and then run a ping. One ping only, uh, with a timeout of one second, because we don't want to wait forever for tests to fail, and we send it to the IP address of our jail. I think we can assume that will succeed, but well, it should succeed. If it doesn't, we've got a problem and we can start debugging things. Next up, let's activate the firewall. So PF control dash E for enable. By default, PF will let any old packet through. If there are no rules, anything will go through. So we test that we can still send a ping message. That will presumably work. Next test does something functional set rules in the jail, block input. What happens when we send the ping to a host uh, that will just drop all incoming packets? Well, hopefully it won't reply. If it does, it might be a psychic host, but that, that, would, be, that would indicate a problem. So in this case, we check that the exit status will be two, and this is actually the slowest part of this test, because we sit around waiting for a second for the, the ping request to time out. Cleanup is really easy, just call cleanup, and the code has remembered what interfaces we've created, what jails we've created, and it will just throw them away. Uh, which means that after you've, you're done with this, you can create new interfaces. There, there should not be a trace left of that jail. And then some more boilerplate where we just tell it that, hey, the test case is, um, is the v4 test case. Um, this is a simplified version of the slightly more extensive test. It does a couple of other things, uh, you know, the really, really, really basic things like when I uh, send, can I filter packets based on port number, for instance? 
So we set up a rule to drop packets to a certain port, but not to another port, and then we try to connect on both of those ports. Uh, only so much room on slides. Um, so we can run this test, and this is an example test run. Um, it, 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 in this case, we actively say, you know, we only want to run the pass block group of tests, and in that group of tests, we only want to run the v4 test. And it will run this test, pass block v4, and it will pass, hopefully. Uh, and it took 1.2 seconds. Remember, one second of this is waiting for an echo reply that will never turn up. So 0.2 seconds to create a something that's really close to a virtual machine, a network interface, set network configuration, test things, and return. So I think we've hit the fast. I think you can also agree that having seen the test, this is not terribly difficult to write. This is a really easy example. There are a couple more complicated scenarios that we test, but still reasonably straightforward to write. The test tool will also keep track of results, so if something fails, you can go back and look at what output did it generate. Uh, of course, this having happened, we've got a test case, so even if it failed and we don't have the output, we can trivially run this again, and we know exactly what it did, we know what we're expecting, we know what did or did, we can reproduce what did or did not happen. You can find these tests in the uh, FreeBSD source tree. You've all got a FreeBSD installation somewhere, I'm sure, so you can find the source code for the tests, you can find where they're installed. To run them, you want to install a couple of packages, uh, you know, FreeBSD's got its uh, PKG package manager. So as soon as you train your fingers to type PKG instead of apt, you're ready to run FreeBSD. You want to load the kernel module. Uh, PFSync uh, depends on PF, so it will implicitly load PF. There are some PFSync tests in the, the test setup as well. Go to the directory and go test, and the test will run. So I think at this point, uh, to reinforce my point, I want to give you a profound quote by someone famous. I couldn't find anyone famous, so there we go. It's just me. Why should you write tests? You can prototype setups. You can uh, write a test to make sure that the, the feature that you depend on won't just break. I think another really excellent argument for writing tests is that you make it easy for me to set. I hope I've convinced you. Um, if there are any questions, I think now's the time. And if not, you can find me outside. Does anyone have any questions? I think we've got time for one. No, everyone, please thank Christoph. <laughs>